Hey folks, welcome back to Combo Class. I'm Whoa. I'm your teacher Demotro, and today I wanted to teach you about something called the roots of unity. So the roots of unity are basically just the numbers that when raised to some positive whole power, get you one. Which might sound like too obvious of a question, but there's a lot of surprising beauty there. Now we're mostly gonna be focused on the third roots of unity because that's where things start to get weird. But let's first take a glimpse at the first two. The first root of unity, meaning which number is the first root of one, can be written as which number raised to the first power equals one. And there's only one number you're gonna find with that property, the number one. But what about the second roots? Now, when I ask which numbers are the second roots or square roots of one, I'm actually not gonna write it with that square root symbol because that radical symbol actually only refers to the principal square root, in this case, the number positive one. And if I wanna get both possible answers, I can write it more like which numbers X is X squared equal to one. And then we get the number one, which squared equals one, and the number negative one, which also, if we square it, gives us one. Both of those are the second roots of unity. But when we go to the third roots of unity, asking which numbers X does X cubed equal one, you might only be able to locate one because one cubed gives us one, but negative one cubed gives us negative one. And so that's not a cube root of one. On this little stretch of number line right here, it seems like there's only one cube root of unity. Why did it go down from having two for the second power to one for the third power? Well, you might be tempted to say when it's an odd exponent, you get less, and when it's an even exponent, you get more. And that's part of the answer, but there's more to the story. If I subtract one from each side on all of these, I get them in the form of x to some power minus one equals zero. And there's something called the fundamental theorem of algebra, which shouldn't be confused with the fundamental theorem of arithmetic we covered in an earlier episode about prime numbers. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that this type of polynomial equation should have as many solutions that equal zero as the highest degree of its exponent on one of the variables. And here we can see that there's two as the highest degree exponent on an X and there are two answers. But what about this one where we have three up there and only see one answer? Where are the other two answers hiding? To figure that out, we could try and factor these expressions. And the first one, you don't need a factor. I just put parentheses around that to make it look like the later cases. But with x squared minus one, you may remember that this little bit, x squared minus one can always factorize into x minus one times x plus one. And if you multiply those together, you'll see we get the x squared minus one and the other bits cancel out. So if we factorize that into this expression, we're basically asking in the second root case, which times does x minus one times x plus one equal zero? And when we have two things multiplied together that we want to equal zero, just one of the parts has to equal zero for that whole thing to multiply to equal zero. So we're basically asking when is x minus one or x plus one equal to zero? And that shows us those two solutions negative one or one as the two things that work, making one of these parts equal to zero, so the whole thing multiplies to zero. But when we look at the third root case, we can try and factorize x cubed minus one, but the only way we can factorize it using that same technique is into x minus one times that whole bit, x squared plus x plus one. 
And that part does reveal one of the solutions. When X is one, that part equals zero, and then the whole thing multiplies to equal zero. And that kind of hints the other two solutions must be hiding in there somewhere. But since we can't factorize that further using the same technique, how do we find where the two are hiding in there? Well, it'll actually help to look at the fourth root case, because surprisingly the fourth roots are simpler looking. The fourth roots of unity are the times where an x to the fourth power minus one equals zero, and we can factorize that into x minus one times x plus one times that bit. And these show that we have the same two solutions from the x squared case again, x being one or being negative one works, and then we might have two more solutions to get all four hidden in this part, x squared plus one. So when can x squared plus one equal zero? If we're asking when x squared plus one can be equal to zero, that's like asking when x squared's equal to negative one, or asking when x is equal to the square root of negative one. So one of those hidden solutions here is that number some of you may dread I. Now, for those of you who hate this number, I think you were tricked by the way it's taught and the way it's named. Imaginary number is a terrible name for it, and it was literally named as a diss by a hater. Rene Descartes, the mathematician and philosopher back in the day, didn't understand or appreciate them, nicknamed them imaginary, and it stuck, even though now we've realized they have tons of practical applications and lots of mathematical value too. And so imaginary numbers is a terrible name. So is complex numbers, meaning the coordinates or numbers that are partially real and partially imaginary, like two plus I or something. Those are known as complex numbers, like a housing complex, meaning that they are in a complex-like zone of multiple types. Not meaning they're complex like hard, but the name makes it sound like they're hard numbers. So imaginary numbers and complex numbers got ripped off in the naming process, but they do have a lot of actual value and we should treat them as legitimate numbers. If you're gonna treat a negative number like a legitimate number, you should treat I as one too. So I is one of the solutions where it squared plus one equals zero. And actually so is negative I. If you do the math on that, if you square that, we get negative I times negative I. The negatives cause a positive. The I's cause a negative one plus one equals zero. So I or negative I are the other two hidden solutions there along with one and negative one. Here's the complex plane, a common great visualization for where imaginary numbers can be seen to live. This is our real number line you're used to where we have how many of a positive thing there, how many of a negative amount there, and this direction is how many I's or that way negative eyes we have and that really shows what imaginary numbers can be seen as a new direction where numbers can live now if you normally just tried to count how many of a thing you had in the real world you'd just be looking at the stretch of numbers from zero toward the positive direction but it made sense for humans to introduce a negative direction as well and sometimes it makes sense to look at another direction, which we're gonna put perpendicular to the real number line as sort of where you're used to the y-axis compared to an x-axis living, and say that this is our real numbers, this is our imaginary numbers, and the whole thing is our complex numbers. And the four solutions we were talking about for this fourth roots of unity before were one, negative one, i, and negative i. 
So here's the solutions for the first, second, and fourth roots of unity, plotted as coordinate points for those numbers on that complex plane. And they all lie somewhere on the unit circle of the complex plane, the circle with radius one and its center at the origin. Not only do they all lie on that circle, but they're evenly spaced out. It's like for the amount of solutions you expect for that fundamental theorem of algebra, you have one solution as a dot on the number one always, and the rest of them as evenly spaced out dots from that on this circle. And that's where the cube roots of unity are hiding. We have the one we expected at the point one, and the other two live where these points that are evenly spaced out from that, if we had three evenly spaced out points on that circle, would be evenly spaced out in the same way that numbers on a clock are. Like if I was at 12 o'clock on some clock, then one would be at three o'clock, negative I would be at six o'clock, and negative one would be at nine o'clock. And for the cube roots, we have one at three o'clock, and these other two would be like where 11 o'clock and seven o'clock are. But what are the numbers associated with those coordinate points? Well, there's a few ways to express them, and some involve e to the power of stuff. You know that classic constant e? Well, we haven't covered Euler's identity yet, which says that negative one is equal to e to the power of pi i. And there's mutant variations of that to describe all these other points, but we'll cover the number e in more detail another day. I wrote these cube root coordinates it's in a slightly more digestible form, as digestible as I could get them, which is that is negative one plus i root three all over two, and that one's negative one minus i root three all over two. And since this is the real number direction, and that is the imaginary direction, this is like saying that it's one half in the negative direction and root three over two tall. And that one's like one half in the negative direction and negative root three halves tall. Now, since these are kind of complicated to use as names for these coordinates, they're often given nicknames. With this cube root of unity nicknamed with the Greek character, well, there's a spider on me. Uh, uh the Greek character Omega, which looks like a W. And this coordinate point doesn't need its own Greek character for a nickname, because it turns out if we take that one, Omega, and square it, multiplying it by itself, either in a geometric sense or by algebraically multiplying that thing by itself and simplifying it, we end up with that point. That point is omega squared. And it turns out there's sort of a reverse property that's similar to that, where if we take omega squared, that point, and square that, it sort of spins it around on this clock-like thing and equals omega again. So they're both each other's square root, and they're both the cube root of that point. And that's just the start of all their cool properties. Not only are these two points each other's square root, they're also each other's reciprocal, meaning one divided by each other. And if you multiply the two together, we get one because that ends up with omega cubed and they're the cube roots of one. And if we add them together, we end up with negative one. And we can find cool clock-like properties on these other roots of unity too. When we just have the number one, if we raise this to different powers, it stays on itself. But when we have negative one in the mix, if we raise negative one to even powers, we end up there. If we raise it to odd powers, we end up there. And it ends up having the options of sort of a two-way bounce. 
And when we have the fourth roots, including i, if we raise i to different powers, it ends up hopping around four parts of this clock-like circle, as if when we're multiplying i by itself more and more times, it's like we're going backwards three hours in time on a clock each time. Similarly, if we multiply omega by itself a bunch of times for the cube root, we end up doing a three-way hop where it's like subtracting four hours on a clock each time, referring to a clock having 12 total. And we actually will see a clock-like shape if we want to see the third roots and the fourth roots on one picture together. Because just like the fourth roots included the second roots, well, the sixth roots will include the third, but not the fourth. And the twelfth roots will include both. So if we look at the twelfth roots of unity, we'll get all of these, all of these, all of those, of course, and more. And it'll be just, oh, just like a clock. In fact, I made a clock out of it. <laughs> Here are the 12th roots of unity, the 12 numbers that if you raised any of them to the 12th power, you'd get one. And it includes the fourth roots of unity, i, negative one, negative i, and one. And it includes our third roots of unity, one, and that stranger looking one, and that stranger looking one. These also all could be written in that form of e to the power of something, but that's a story for another day. These are ways we can sort of visualize the coordinates in terms of how far is it in the real number direction, some of them being one half in a direction, some being root three over two in a direction, and how far is it up or down, also being a half or root three over two in these cases. And here we have these 12 magical numbers that have all sorts of properties along the lines of these ones that they do that the cube roots of unity had, where if you raise them to different powers, they hop to each other in clock-like ways. And I'm sure that we'll come back to these 12th roots of unity at some point. So I'll save this clock somewhere special and try not to let it get too destroyed in the classroom. So although the cube roots of unity or 12th roots may seem like obscure coordinates in this complex, partially imaginary realm, they actually are just points on a circle, a spin away from one. For the cube roots, the points that we could spin in thirds away of a clock, kind of like four hours at a time on a typical clock. Or for the twelfth roots, the ones that we spend what a clock would call one hour at a time although we would call this direction counterclockwise. And if we took them to other types of powers, they would do other interesting hops and paint out shapes kind of similar to some shapes we saw in our Star Polygon episode. All right, folks, that's all for today. Thank you for joining me here in Combo, in combo Class. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next episode.